Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day 
in every corner of the world. In schools, in theatres, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Hello, everyone. We are so happy you could join us today for our first ever TEDx Rutgers Camden brand new ending conference. We are so excited to bring live TEDx talks to you. In fact, this wouldn't have been possible between a certain conversation between Preeti and I. Around this time last year, Preeti and I jumped on a Zoom call where she asked if she could explain ideas she had in mind. Me thinking this would only take 30 minutes, it took three hours. She helped me though see her idea and little did I know it would change our lives fundamentally. Back in 2020, we had the vision of bringing an inspiring and accessible stage to Camden, not only for our campus community, but for our local community as well to be viewed through a different lens and ultimately share ideas worth spreading in order to inspire, innovate, and bring about positive change. We built our team and earned a license from TED amidst a pandemic, and finally, we're bringing a conference to you. And although we initially planned for an in-person TEDx conference on January 22nd, the main priority for our TEDx team, crew, speakers, and the whole community at large was to ensure our safety at all costs. Hence, us speaking to you through a digital screen today. Our TEDx conference theme is Brand New Ending. It comes from the quote, we can't go back and make a brand new beginning, but we can start now and make a brand new ending. We hope you truly take away a diverse meaning from this quote by the end of the conference today. And we see this theme resonate with our city today, tomorrow, and in the future. Like Preeti said, we can change our beginnings, but we can start now and work towards a de desirable ending. With this pandemic and seeing how it affected our community, it made us want to bring ideas worth spreading and build a space for connection, critical thinking, and so much more. Just seeing how the city responded to the pandemic socially, academically, and communally inspired us to continue this. If you haven't done so already, please follow us on our social media platforms linked below. With the TEDx chapter, there's so much going on all the time, from team recruitment and speaker selection to new conference dates and themes. We really want you to stay connected. If you're looking to speak to some of these TEDx speakers that you see today, please join us for our live speaker meet and greet session tomorrow on Zoom at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You'll get a chance to ask some questions as well as connect with our speakers. The RSVP link is below. Now, please bear with us as we have to thank these amazing people and organizations that made this TEDx conference possible. We would like to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors, especially School of Social Work, Department of Philosophy and Religion, Abbey Research, Rutgers School of Business Camden, Rutgers Camden Alumni Association, and RE Films for their utmost support towards our mission and vision. And last but not least, we're extremely grateful for our speaker coaches, Barik Berkavi, Priya Karthik, Rebecca Masood, Taruna Romani, Kim Smith, and Christina Starbuck, who have invested so much time and passion into our TEDx speakers as well as our advisors, Marla Blunt Carter, Dan Rosenthal, Natalie Cox, and Ajit George, who have guided us during our toughest times. The production team at Rutgers Camden has helped us tremendously 
from preparing for the almost in-person conference to the video you are seeing right now, we wanna give a big shout out to Robert Emmons, Jim Mobley, Josh Dowiak, Kelly Oster, Hunter Smith, Jim Brown, Kristen Walker, Zach Lomas, and Michael Burke. And finally, our team members that have worked day and night this past year to make this conference a reality. Without you guys, we would definitely not be here today. Open your mind and enjoy the show. To start off, we have a welcome message from the Rutgers University president. Please welcome President Jonathan Holloway. Hello, I'm Jonathan Holloway, president of Rutgers. I was honored when the students at Rutgers Camden asked me to offer a welcome to you all today. One of the great privileges of being a university president is associating yourself with the outstanding work being accomplished by students, faculty, and staff across your institution. That's the case again today. Our students have worked hard to create the opportunity for the Camden community and the wider audience to enjoy this platform for sharing exciting, innovative discussions in the TED Talks tradition. I'm confident that today's talks at the TEDx Rutgers Camden brand new ending conference will engage you, inspire you, teach you, and challenge you to make positive change in your life and in our world. There is a team that stands behind today's impressive roster of presenters. These young people have found at Rutgers University Camden a deep sense of community. This community has shown them love, compassion, respect, and a commitment to the life of the mind. These students recognize that excellence abounds in a university like Rutgers, and they want to help celebrate and cultivate that excellence for the greater good. I can't tell you how proud I am of their efforts in organizing this event, the first ever TEDx conference in the city of Camden. They recognize the power of ideas to change lives. And just as important to me, they believe very strongly in the democratic possibilities that Rutgers Camden creates. They see excellence in their classmates. They know what it is to expand horizons because they witness their faculty doing so every week and they want to share that excitement with all of us. I've had the good fortune to present at two different TEDx events uh, previously in my life. Each one was incredibly important and rewarding in different ways. The most powerful way though, is that it allowed me and other presenters the opportunity to share ideas that evoked our passions, that illuminated why we wanted to do the things that we did in our lives. And listening to one another, listening to those great ideas coming forward was always a moment of pure inspiration for me. I suspect it's going to be the same way for you. In fact, the TEDx platform allowed me to be brave in sharing some of my ideas. In one case, I won't tell you when, I actually sang for everybody. I'm not gonna do that today. You're welcome. As I close, I want to thank our students, faculty advisors and speech coaches and other supporters for planning today's conference. I know you're in for a terrific day. A lot of care and creativity has gone into planning, and I want to thank all our speakers for taking time to share their minds today. Welcome again to TEDx Rutgers Camden. Thank you. We live in a culture that champions on having a singular focus of health and well being, but somehow many of us still feel that we don't have enough time for ourselves. Why is that? Because making times for ourselves isn't that easy, is it? We have relationships, commitments, obligations, but more importantly, expectations. And these expectations are heavily based on what we do or don't do for others. So as we spend all this time giving to others as they give back to us, it's just a never ending cycle of giving. But how do we practice self care while still actively caring for others? To answer this question is wellness expert, Yasmin Cheyenne who is known for her transformative teachings around self-healing, which she offers through keynote speeches, corporate presentations, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Yasmin has appeared on the Today Show, Forbes Magazine, and has collaborated with many other wellness influencers. Her talk is titled, How Boundaries Make Space for What We Truly Desire. Creating a sense of home is a challenge that most of us struggle with. 
This isn't about a physical home, but the feeling of safety that we carry within ourselves. This feeling of security, no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through in life, grounds us and allows us to soar. Growing up, the kitchen was one of those safe spaces where I could unwind, laugh, and of course eat. It's like that for so many of us because it's where the snacks live, or the coffee, or the wine. I love to cook, so being in a kitchen has always been special to me. I remember cooking the most with my grandmother, and when we'd cook together, she'd always show me how to do things, but she also explained why we were doing them. She'd explain why we were cleaning the chicken, or why we were taking the tips off the green beans, or why we were shredding the cheese the night before. At the same time, if I got in the way of what she was doing, I would get fussed at. It was what I would call a loving fuss. It was never mean and it didn't hurt me. In fact, I missed those fussing moments a ton. In those moments, my grandmother was reminding me that yes, she was allowing me to cook in her kitchen. However, I was still in her space, her kitchen. Those moments in the kitchen with her gave me lessons on boundaries, awareness, respect, accountability, and paying attention without even knowing it. I didn't understand this at the time, but what I've learned is when you understand why you're doing what you're doing, you get buy-in with yourself. It's no longer just a chore, it's something that you believe in and becomes a part of the process. Fast forward 20 years or so, as I sat in my kitchen one afternoon, the hub of my family home, holding my newborn in one arm who was protesting naps that week, and looking at my list of things to do in the other, I realized I was beyond exhausted. There was no amount of coffee or fresh air that could have helped me cope with the continually growing mountain of responsibilities I had. My clothes had stains on them from breastfeeding or eating, honestly, who knows, I just felt like a mess. I was done feeling like I had to be everything to everyone when I had nothing for myself. For some reason, on this day, the people-pleasing, just go ahead and do it part of me was resistant to show up. I didn't want to keep pushing forward like nothing was wrong. I looked around my kitchen and saw a jar of sugar and everything became incredibly clear. I saw my kitchen as an energetic interpretation of my life. The constant to-do list, the disorder, the chaos, that feeling of always having something to do or someone to serve was all there. At that moment, I saw that I was accessible to anyone who wanted a piece of me, whether it be my boss, my friends, or my family. I realized that the sugar in the sugar jar represented my energy, my time, my resources, anything that I could offer to anyone. The jar represented the boundaries, the safety, and had the responsibility of holding me together while still being vulnerable as a glass jar. I thought having a solid jar was the full extent of setting healthy boundaries. I thought ensuring that my sugar was in the jar was enough to keep the sugar protected but I forgot about the lid. The sugar was sweet and attractive to others, and because the lid was off, it gave everyone permission to come in and take what they needed when they needed it. And do you know why? Because I didn't put a lid on my jar. And in other words, it was my responsibility to put boundaries in place and say no, and it was my fault that I never did. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to clean up sugar? It gets in every single crevice and it's hard to pick up each and every tiny granule. When we begin the journey of maintaining our sugar jar, it can feel enormous. You might feel like there are parts of you everywhere with no idea how you're going to bring yourself back together. But to get to the life we want, we have to start where we are in this moment. And sometimes that means starting with cleaning up what's in front of us before we can move on to filling ourselves up. As you're losing parts of yourself, it can be tough to overcome the feelings of resentment because you know there are some parts of you that you won't ever get back. Those pieces of sugar that have fallen into places you won't ever be able to find. Most of you desire connected relationships that feel fulfilling and add to your life in wonderful ways. You want to have meaningful conversations and experiences that are easy and feel joyful. But 
When you enter your kitchen and look into your sugar jar and realize it's empty, you also recognize that you don't have enough energy to spend time with the people or commitments that matter most to you. In the real world, when you go to make your tea or your coffee, you add sugar to it so it dilutes the bitterness. But when you find that your sugar jar is empty, you're left to sip on a bitter drink. And guess what? That bitterness leaks into every area of your life. There's bitterness in your friendships, in your marriage, at work, and even in the relationship with your children because you have nothing left for yourself. So the one question you need to ask yourself is, how do I make sure that I never let my sugar jar go empty again? You might be thinking, well, perhaps I can put my sugar in many different jars, one for work, one for home, one for me. But we don't have multiple sugar jars in our kitchen, do we? Just like there aren't multiples of us. You have one jar of sugar for everything and everyone that matters to you. So how can we begin taking care of our sugar jar? Our first responsibility is to maintain the sugar you already have by asking yourself questions like, do I want to say yes when I say yes? Do I want to stay late when I stay late? Do I want to remain in this relationship when I know it's draining me? Sometimes, because we're afraid to let others down, we choose to betray ourselves instead. We choose the discomfort of keeping others happy over the discomfort we feel within. So take a moment right now and think about your sugar jar. How full is your jar? Where or to whom do you give most of your sugar? And most importantly, do you have any left for yourself? Sometimes it's hard to pinpoint the circumstances that empty your jar because the patterns, cycles, or routines that are draining you have become the norm. The good news is it doesn't have to stay that way. And the better news is that we can replenish what was lost. On that day in my kitchen, I realized that we are responsible for the people who have access to us and how much of ourselves we choose to give away. The amazing thing about realizing you're responsible for your empty jar is you also have the power to fill it. Once you understand the importance of maintaining the sugar in your jar, the next step is to own the power of choice that you have. It's true, we can't control everything around us, but it's also true that we have more control than we sometimes allow ourselves access to. It's incredibly liberating to give yourself the power of choice. We struggle to set healthy boundaries when we don't have awareness of the power we have to say yes only when we really want to. When we don't own our power to choose, we're more likely to overextend ourselves. We give money we don't have, we give time we don't have, and we stay in relationships long after we know they're over. We do these things out of the belief that this is what good people do, this is what kind people do, and then we carry the burden that we should be doing this too. But the more important question is, do you want to be doing this? Yes, you said yes, but is this yes genuine? Or is it because you didn't know you had a choice? Our sugar jars never lie. We may tell ourselves stories that skew our perception of how the truth shows up, but our sugar jar will always clearly show when it's empty. When we're honest with ourselves about the things that aren't working for us, we're able to make useful changes. For example, being honest doesn't mean that we'll have to walk away from every relationship but it does mean we'll give ourselves the freedom to decide if we want to continue with things as they are. Through honesty, we can explore how much of ourselves we're dedicating to others and then shift how we show up in those relationships so that our needs are met too. How often have you committed yourself to a to-do list that doesn't even have you on it? Rows and rows of tasks that continue to deplete your sugar jar with no end in sight. To have the ease and the peace that so many of us desire, we must prioritize ourselves. Filling our sugar jar comes first so that we have the capacity to dedicate ourselves to the things that we actually care about. So let me ask you this. What positive impact could you make on your life by changing the way you interact with yourself? Here's something sweet for you to remember. 
The acronym SUGAR is a reminder that you can S, say no. U, use your voice. G, give to yourself too. A, always check within. And R, resist the urge to overgive. If each one of us took the time to maintain our sugar jars, we'd have the freedom that so many of us are seeking. Freedom to nurture relationships, freedom to see new places, even the freedom to just be. With a full sugar jar, we can begin to build a life that we're excited for every day. I have learned that the most important thing you can do for yourself is to be brave enough to choose to fill yourself back up again, no matter how empty you've become. So with that, I ask you, how's your sugar jar? Thank you for listening. Thank you for a great start to the conference, Yasmin. Our next talk is about AI in the future. Technology isn't just a tool, it's a life form, and it's the fastest growing life form on our planet, including us. There are some obvious and well-documented concerns when it comes to the dangers of technology as you progress through society. But there's one that's far less perceptible, robot cultural appropriation. I bet this wasn't the first thing on your list or even the 10th if on the list at all. To shed a light on this unseen threat, we have Sinead Bowell, a fashion model, futurist, and founder of Way, a tech education company that prepares youth for the future with advanced technologies. Sinead's talk is titled, If We Aren't Careful, Technology May Create New Ways to Exploit People's Racial Identities. I study the future for a living. I cannot predict it. And if you come across anybody who claims they can, I would probably just advise you to calmly look for the nearest exit. But what I can do is examine a bunch of data and build forecasts about where the future may be headed. This is Shudu Graham. She's a striking South African model, likely on the path to a supermodel. Scroll through her Instagram. You can see all of the big campaigns she's landed. She's been featured in Vogue a few times, which is kind of like the Holy Grail. And she's also an activist. She uses her platform as a rising black supermodel to call for more diversity in fashion. And I think that's incredibly admirable. There's another fact about Shudu. She isn't real. She's a digital construction, an avatar, or what we call in the tech world, computer-generated imagery. This revelation, big or small, depending on your pre-existing trust issues with the internet, hasn't hurt Shudu's career one bit. In fact, she's been thriving. She was even dubbed the world's first digital supermodel. As a futurist, I wasn't entirely shocked to see an avatar as a fashion model because most jobs will be impacted by technology, including fashion modeling. And this is a very real challenge we all need to be preparing for. But I wanna share with you another consequence I find concerning. Shudu is black and identifies as female. The person who created and who controls her is white and male. The future is heading in a direction where people can create and control identities outside of their own ethnic groups. This creates ample opportunity for exploitation of already marginalized communities. And if we aren't careful, this could become a massive societal problem. Avatars are stepping into industries from every angle. Microsoft alone plans to introduce avatars to the 250 million people around the world who use Microsoft Teams. There are avatars on social media with over 3 million followers. And this is an image of Samsung's AI-powered avatars called Neons, which are being designed for roles such as news anchor, spokesperson, and movie actor. Picture the dynamic with Shudu, but across all of these industries. Right off the bat, I see two glaring opportunities for exploitation, through profit and through misrepresentation. People can create and profit off of the ethnicity an avatar represents without being a part of that ethnic group 
And this is very significant. Avatars are replacing real people in a lot of scenarios. Shudu represents a real black fashion model. But the income her identity generates isn't going to black women. It's going to a white man. This financially shuts out black women while their image is still being profited off of. And there's a lot of money to be made here. The average fashion model makes between 41,000 and 300,000 a year. The ability to create avatars redirects all of this income, just not necessarily into the hands of the people the avatar represents. And it's important to point out that access to the market that creates avatars like Shudu, it isn't equal. Creating this type of an avatar requires access to financial resources, the computers, the programs. It requires access to very specific tech skills and the time and environment to build those skills. There are structural challenges that make it harder for some communities to access these resources over others. And therefore some groups, more specifically marginalized communities, may be much less likely to be the ones who get to create the avatars and much more likely to be the ones who get profited off of. And in this example, we see this dynamic playing out at the expense of black women. The second area for exploitation to occur is in the pursuit of profit. The group the avatar represents may be drastically misrepresented. They may be stereotyped, appropriated, manipulated. In this example, a black woman is being represented through the eyes of a white man. The features, skin tone, hairstyles, he finds desirable. There is ample opportunity for misrepresentation and stereotyping here, which marginalizes real black women. Shudu could also be used to model for a brand a black woman may never have agreed to work with. And when you zoom out a bit, you can see this scenario playing out as a loophole for companies. Instead of having to invest in diversity or improve company culture around inclusion, a company could just create avatars from different ethnic groups instead and manipulate the relationship those groups may have with that company. And finally, when a dominant culture takes elements from a less dominant group and derives commercial benefit from it, it's usually called cultural appropriation. In a world with avatars, this becomes incredibly complicated. Everything from the items and the clothing the avatar may be styled in to the entire identity of the avatar itself. Take this image of Shudu, posted to her Instagram, wearing the sacred neck rings associated with the Indabele people of South Africa, and a black power emoji as the caption. The person deriving commercial benefit from this image is a white man. I call this robot cultural appropriation. And what makes it incredibly complicated and deceptive is that you can't really spot it unless you know the identity of the creator behind the avatar. I'm focusing on the example of exploitation through the context of modeling, but picture the avatar as a physician, a teacher, a social worker. The same questions still emerge. Avatars are going to play an important role in our society. We need to ensure that the rooms where they're being created are accessible and reflective of the diverse society we live in, or else this dynamic will just continue. There are other technologies where these exploitative dynamics are creeping in, such as virtual reality, a technology many of us will soon be engaging with if you haven't already. And just in case you aren't familiar with virtual reality, it currently involves putting on a headset and stepping into a live virtual world as an avatar or as a digital character. And I emphasize the word currently because the technology we use to access these virtual worlds will continue to evolve. PwC forecasts that by 2030, over 23 million jobs will involve extended reality technologies like VR. And for the record, that was very much a forecast, not a prediction. Firefighting departments are using it to simulate real-life scenarios. 
Medical schools are using it to train future doctors on how to perform surgery. A company that sells virtual reality simulations recently made headlines for hiring actors to play roles from ethnic groups they don't belong to. For example, white actors were acting as black and Asian characters in the simulation. And the scenes they were acting out were very sensitive to these ethnic groups, such as a traumatized employee after an incident of racial injustice. If these scenes weren't taking place in virtual reality, instead it was a live play on stage, would white actors still be playing black and Asian characters? So the question becomes, do we care about the identities people take on in virtual reality? If that person is supposed to be speaking about or representing a specific ethnic group, like in this example, and profiting off of that identity, I believe we should care because the same opportunities for exploitation exist, profit and misrepresentation. Unlike the previous example, where technology was replacing the job of a human, in virtual reality, the job might not be going away. Actors were still being cast to play black and Asian characters. It's just the jobs didn't go to people from either of those communities, and neither did the profits. The same way we probably wouldn't cast a white actor to play a South Asian character in a movie or represent a South Asian voice in a cartoon. We need to start considering how these dynamics should play out in newer forms of media. And when it comes to misrepresentation, there's something very troubling about a marginalized group not being able to speak about their own marginalized experiences, even if it's in virtual reality, while another group benefits from it. There is ample opportunity for stereotyping and cultural insensitivity when people don't get to tell their own stories. Some of the world's biggest tech companies are betting on virtual reality as the workplace of the future. This is an image from Meta, formerly known as Facebook, their vision for the future of work. It is still largely up for debate whether or not this vision will come true. But imagine the possibilities if it does. And we don't get this right. Companies asking employees to use indigenous and Latino avatars in client meetings because they know it will look good to show more diversity on the team. A DJ who changes the ethnicity of her avatar depending on which music event she's marketing herself to. For this talk, I focus on exploitation through the lens of race, but similar questions are raised in the context of disability, gender, and sexual orientation people leveraging these technologies to exploit people from these communities. Our future with technology presents these opportunities and it causes me a lot of concern. And I hope it causes you concern too. But these scenarios, they don't have to be the future we end up in. We have a choice in the way we create technology and in the way we use it. We need to always consider how the technologies we build intersect with socio-demographic factors, such as race, gender, and sexual orientation. We need to pay close attention to who's in the room when we're coding the future, making sure these rooms are diverse and reflective of the society we want to live in. And ensuring everyone has equal access to these rooms needs to be a top priority. And we also have a role to play as individuals in shaping the ethical standards and etiquette we want to see in technology. It shouldn't just be up to a few people or a few companies. These technologies impact all of our lives, but it requires us to lean in to technology, to learn about it, to engage with it, so we can steer it and we can shape it. Technology will allow us to present our humanity to the world in new ways. And in some ways, it may be amazing that we can play parts that aren't us. There may be specific contexts where this is a good thing, but it doesn't mean we should wholeheartedly accept people playing different roles 
without questioning the ethics behind it. Who the puppeteer is matters. The person pulling the strings matters. And I ask that you think deeply about that. The next time you're greeted by an avatar, ask yourself, who is this person? Who is the person behind the curtain? Thank you. What a great talk, Sinead. Our next talk is about perspective. And as we talk about perspective, I want you to keep one word in mind, protagonist. In any story, the protagonist is the central figure that all other story elements move around. They are typically the main characters. We are the protagonists of our lives. We are the main characters of our story. But unlike fiction, the world that we move through does not revolve around us. The people that we interact with are not side characters in service of our personal narrative. But we are protagonists nonetheless, equipped with a first-person perspective and all of its limitations. Subjectivity, bias, lack of information, these are all side effects of our existence that we're inherently vulnerable to. But just like any good character in a good story, we can be dynamic protagonists exploring the world and those that inhabit it through the lens of growth and understanding rather than self-reinforcement. Our next speaker, Dr. Wayne Purnell, will show us how to diversify our first-person perspective by adopting a new one, a parallax perspective. Dr. Purnell is an accomplished mindset speaker and best-selling author whose works have been featured in ma major publications such as Forbes and the New York Times. His talk today is titled, How a Parallax Perspective Can Disrupt Perceptual Bias. Our frame of reference affects everything. We judge the world based on our experiences. At dinner the other night, I observed a guy in his 20s with his snap cap on backwards. He was hunched over his plate, chewing with his mouth open and shoveling food into it as if his goal was not to taste what he was eating. My thoughts went to judgment and then I realized I don't know anything about him. Nothing. And I'm sure that if he observed me, he'd think all kinds of things, many of which might be true, but then again, maybe not. Our experiences to this point have given us a unique lens through which we view and filter the world. We each develop expectations about how the world and the people in it should be. It is that which defines our perceptual bias. As humans, we're designed to stay alive. We protect our physical being and we protect our psychological being. Perhaps slightly insidiously, we protect the schema or map of the world that we have constructed. We're willing to defend what we know because our identities are tied to what we know. We know what we know and we're drawn towards things that resonate with our values even if we're not fully conscious of doing so. Because of this, we need to be deliberate if we're to step away from what we already know and presume about the world. We can then be open to learning or trying something new. When we judge someone, or even ourselves, we subconsciously seek confirmation and validation of our premise. We're good at something, bad, right, wrong, stupid, gifted, and on and on. We pick up on the things that validate this and somehow ignore other information that might push against our beliefs. That is, we automatically tune into the things we expect. Again, this is our perceptual bias. The problem with perceptual bias is that not only do we bind ourselves to certain norms, but we also attempt to hold others to the norms we believe they should be held to. Rosenthal's research back in 1963 showed us that the bias toward an expected outcome influenced the way people engaged and therefore actually created the outcomes that were expected. Essentially, our beliefs affect our actions. Those actions affect the way others respond to us and then their responses reinforce our beliefs about them, and so we act in a certain way. We get validating feedback, and that cycle reinforces what we already know, so we engage in the world with a stronger bias. And where does that leave us? Divided. Separated. Isolated. 
Presuming that growth and learning are desired, what's needed is a new mind state, an active state of mind that mandates a move to disrupt our hidden perceptual biases. We need to look at the world differently. What if we deliberately pushed ourselves to become curious and to see the situation, the other person or ourselves differently? Could we acknowledge that there might be something we're missing? Could we seek to fill in the unknown gap in a quest for more information? Yes, and that is why a parallax perspective is needed. Parallax comes from the Latin word parallaxis, meaning change. And your perspective, how you look at something, makes all the difference in how you react to it. Try this for a second. If you're able, just hold up one finger in front of your face and look at it. Now close one eye. Open that eye and close the other one. Now shift back and forth a few times here, opening one eye while closing the other. You'll notice that your finger or the background behind it jumps back and forth as you change which eye is open and which eye is closed. If you saw your finger and or the background jump back and forth, you experienced a parallax shift. Whether or not you're able to do the exercise, recognize that you can take this concept into your everyday life. The key here is to leverage the fact that you can see things differently. And that then begs the question, what else is there? Or what might I be missing? Moving on the premise that there is more to explore about a situation, a person, or even yourself, and wielding the questions based in wonder, you've stepped into a powerful position, that of curiosity. Curiosity is the key to seeing things from more than one point of view. Acknowledging that there is more than one point of view and then choosing to be curious and explore what that might be, both opens the world to you and brings you closer to others. Remember that a parallax perspective is based on change and perception. When we cling tightly to the perception that we had, we find evidence that maintains that bias. And if we believe that other possibilities exist and we engage in curiosity as a personal methodology, asking ourselves, I wonder what else there is, we remove this kind of ego, ethno, and social-centric disconnect. This act of curiosity opens the door to asking new questions and yielding new insights. In essence, curiosity deliberately invokes a parallax perspective. It was Emerson who said that the mind once stretched by a new idea can never return to its original dimensions. What would happen if we thought in terms of a parallax perspective all the time? When we choose to live from a place of wonder and curiosity about what more there might be, we train ourselves to think in a way that expands our awareness. And as our awareness expands, we crave further expansion. That is the antidote to perceptual bias. There is one essential ground rule or working agreement we each must make with ourselves. Simply this, we have to want to change the way we see the world. Remember that no one comes to a debate looking to be persuaded about the other side. And the good news is that deliberately choosing a parallax perspective isn't a debate, quite the opposite. Being deliberate about seeking a parallax perspective opens the world to you in ways you haven't yet imagined. By actively pursuing an alternative view, any alternate view, we invite the possibility of more, more information, greater connection, and an increase in personal power, and certainly a new truth. Your personal truth comes from experience and that develops when you choose to expand your view of the world. From the way a guy eats his dinner to the way your finger or background jumps when you close one eye. We live with perceptual biases, conscious and unconscious, which divide us all the while we long to feel connected or a part of something. 
We instinctively protect ourselves against people and ideals that oppose what we cling to as our truth. And yet each of us, worldwide, each of us, could expand our worldviews and personal truths by being just that bit more deliberate about choosing curiosity and employing the parallax perspective. Assume there's more and explore what that might be. What might I be missing about this situation, this person, or myself? More positively, what more is there? Stay curious. Employing curiosity as the keystone of the parallax perspective disrupts perceptual bias and creates the path, person by person, for how we'll significantly connect humanity. Thank you, Dr. Pennell. Next one is a beautiful piece by Dylan himself. Dylan Dixon is an classically trained multi-instrumentalist, composer, and a junior here at Rutgers Camden, a lifelong student of the arts. He has begun to explore his own artistic expression in many different forms, ranging from fictional writing and poetry to art and music production. Along with campus commitments, he is a valuable member of our own TEDx curation team. Today, he showcases an original composition titled Movement One.
Thank you, Dylan, for sharing your amazing talent with us today. Now I'd like to prepare all of you for our next talk about the Great Resignation. The Great Resignation describes a mass surge in unemployment rates that have been leaving hiring signs outside of almost every business for the past two years. Statistics will tell you that the Great Resignation was primarily a result of the pandemic. This is implying that employment was only simply just a paycheck. But this isn't really true. Most people want to utilize their skills and talents as best as they can through a job, which adds positively value to their lives. So if the problem isn't with the employees, we're only left to look at the employers. Our next speaker, best-selling author and CEO of Ultimate Assistant Training, Bonnie Lo Craman, will explain the inevitable consequences of employers not understanding what their staff truly needs. Her talk is titled, The Real Reasons People Quit. You know what gets me? What really gets me is that look in their eyes, that defeated, beaten up look. When people quit their jobs, you can see it. It's right there. And we remember exactly what happened like it was yesterday. And it stays inside as in forever doesn't it? After all, no one ever starts a new job thinking that someday they are going to be forced to quit. But that's what's happening in record numbers. The truth is that I saw this great resignation in motion long before COVID-19. It's just that people are leaving faster now because they finally can. What was true long before March of 2020 and what is true now is that people join companies, but they leave managers. That is the heart of the matter when it comes to quitting. I've taught executive assistants and leaders in 14 countries and 38 states. And this talk is what I know from that experience. One of the biggest reasons why people quit is because of workplace bullying which is a humiliating and complicated experience and really hard to talk about, impossible for some, which is what happened with my student, Victoria. Despite being a skilled, intelligent, and experienced executive assistant, Victoria was bullied by a series of managers in her career. A soft-spoken person, she found herself harshly judged and underestimated she felt unable to fight back, and that ate away at her confidence. Victoria told our class that over time, she came to wear an invisible backpack that held a heavy rock inside. She called it her rock of insignificance. Victoria wore that backpack for 38 years until with coaching and support, she finally found her voice and was able to quit the bully. She took off that backpack once and for all and vowed to never be silent or insignificant again. Another all too common reason why people quit is because of sexual harassment, which is demoralizing to the core, embarrassing, and fills women with self-doubt as they're forced to question their own behaviors in the search for who is really at fault. People quit from being repeatedly overlooked for raises and promotions, not being supported to get training, extreme burnout due to overwork, and rules that apply to some, but not all. People quit because of managers who look the other way in the face of racism and discrimination which causes a profound sense of betrayal, not to mention serious mental health issues. These are the real reasons why people quit their jobs, not the ones they write in letters of resignation or say at exit interviews. The real reasons rarely make the news articles because they are so painful to disclose. However, when people leave, little bits of their souls 
left behind, that doesn't make the news either. And 35 years ago, I was this close to quitting my job in the first year as I was the publicity director of the whole theater in Montclair, New Jersey. I loved my job and got to work side by side with the artistic director as we figured out how to promote each play. About eight months in, I got a new manager who sat me down and told me that effective immediately, I was no longer allowed to speak directly to the artistic director and that I could only communicate with her through him. I was stunned and I had no idea how to respond. As a 29 year old young woman, I knew this was about power and wow, did I feel powerless. I also felt angry and disoriented and muzzled. I remember everything about that day, what I was wearing, how hot it was, and how I decided to quit, but not until I found another job. It turned out that the artistic director ended up firing that new manager, and she asked me to stay. And I did for 25 years. That artistic director was Oscar-winning actress Olympia Dukakis. My life would have turned out very differently had I quit. Today, we are living in a YOLO economy. You only live once with lots of people asking themselves tough questions about how and where they want to live. In a matter of days, the pandemic sent much of our workforce home to work and many of them discovered that they thrived without a commute and without the daily interactions with their managers. So how are managers handling all of this? The data shows that it costs a company an average of six to nine months of an employee's annual salary to replace them. For an hourly non-salaried employee, it costs $1,500 or more to replace them. Pretty expensive, right? So if a manager is aware of the steep financial cost of hiring and replacing staff, why then are they not doing more to stop this race to the exit? Well, I found my light bulb answer to that question in a 2012 poll that reported that the average age that a leader receives their very first training in managing people is age 42. In that same poll updated in 2021, the average age is now 46. Incredibly, the age has gone up that's too long. The connection between lack of management training for leaders and this great resignation is unmistakable. So it's not that managers are setting out to be bad or abusive. It's simply that they have not learned how. The essentials of what drives people to stay and what sends them running. Imagine this instead. What if those managers came to understand much sooner what their staff really wanted? And what if they came to care what motivates a team to be loyal and to go above and beyond every single day? And what if those things cost little to no money so that the solutions are available for everyone? Well, here are the top four things in order and from my experience, that staff needs to stay. One, respect. Two, belonging. Three, money. Four, career growth. Now I'm sure you noticed that money was not number one. Definitely not. Respect. Respect is the number one most important ingredient in the global workplace. That is as true in Camden, New Jersey, as it is in Auckland, New Zealand, and every other place you can name. It is a universal truth that when people feel respected, most everything becomes possible. Since respect is so important, what exactly does it look like? 
Respect can mean simple things like saying please, thank you, saying your name and pronouncing it right, and showing up at your father's funeral. Respect means making it safe to speak the truth without backlash and managers who don't shy away from difficult conversations. Respectful managers don't have all the answers, but their staff knows that they will be dealt with honestly and fairly. Because you know what? The staff knows when things aren't fair. Respectful managers stand up to bullies, sexual harassers, and racists. They are willing to take action even when it is super uncomfortable and even unpopular to do so. This is what respect looks like. The second most important thing that staff wants is to belong, to feel valued, appreciated, important. Managers do this by making it their business to understand the unique talents and skills of their team as individual contributors. Every member of a team has been hired for a reason. So when those reasons are fully leveraged, the staff knows that they belong and that they, are, they have genuine purpose. The third most important thing that staff wants is to be fairly compensated. Money is one of those topics that still feels so forbidden in many organizations. So the most effective managers are the ones committed to pay transparency and pay equity. These managers clearly see the wage gap that exists between women and men, and they don't pretend that it doesn't exist. And the fourth most important thing that staff wants is to have a runway for growth and opportunities to keep learning. This means not having to apologize for being ambitious or fight for training dollars. The smartest managers know that nothing feeds a person's soul more than being supported to keep learning. These managers not only have the highest team retention, but also the highest productivity, engagement, and profits. The return on investment of managers giving their staff these four things is immediate and positive in every way. And for professionals and new college grads who are searching for their next job, the setup for success is to seek out company cultures that enthusiastically embrace and promote these four values as priorities for every employee. None of us knows what the future brings, what new variant, what new technology, what next crisis may be around the corner. However, we do know that as long as the world's workers are comprised of human beings, that what we all want is to do work that matters with people who respect and value us, pay us fairly, and support us to grow. When that happens, they don't quit, they stay. Several years ago, I got to see this with my own eyes on an overnight flight to London. Everyone else was sleeping, but not me. I found myself watching this flight attendant doing his work so obviously happy in the middle of the night. We had a cup of coffee together and I asked him about his work and he instantly stood up taller and he said, I love my job. I love the people and they respect me. And I don't care that other airlines pay more money. They don't have what this one has. Leaders who treat me like a person. Imagine, imagine the new workplace where people will join companies and they will stay longer committed to their managers because they are committed to them. Doing this will radically reset and transform this war for talent. It will without question turn the tide of this great resignation not to mention save millions of dollars in replacing staff and improving our overall mental health. Now that would be a brand new ending that will not only benefit you, but your children and mine.
and generations to come. I'm Bonnie Lo Craman. Thank you very much. Wow, Bonnie, that was such an insightful talk. Now for our next talk, which is just as captivating. I like to refer back to the concept of a parallax perspective, particularly how it can be used to combat perceptual bias. Now that we understand how we can use this perspective to combat perceptual bias, let's see its application in action for our next talk. Specifically, how this new open-minded perspective we learned about applies to the ableism, one of the biggest sources of perceptual bias there is. Our next speaker, aspiring activist, fashion designer, entrepreneur, is Angeline Desgrenik. She will share her perspective of the disabled experience from someone who has lived it firsthand. Her talk is titled, What Disabled People Really Need. In August of 2021, I was at a Christmas shop in South Jersey with my boyfriend when a man suddenly came up to us. My boyfriend was a bit startled and so was I. He moved out of the way as the man bent down in front of me saying, hello and what's your name? My name is Angeline, but at that moment I felt a bit fearful. I'm 21 years old, but I was thinking about the do not tell strangers your name rule I was taught in kindergarten. Normally, I would tell people my name, given professional context, but in that moment, I felt like a small child again, and pretty vulnerable. I told him my initials, AJ. He didn't say a single word to my boyfriend before leaving. When we went up to the cashier to pay for a souvenir, she asked me if I was AJ. She pulled out a Christmas ornament with, who would have thought, the letters A and J printed on it. A few moments later, everything seemed to click. I had an inkling of why the man did this, and this wasn't the first time something like this happened to me. When we left the store, I asked my boyfriend if he thought that what the man did was a good thing. The man did a kind thing, he said, and added that, generally, Giving gifts to strangers is a kind act, but undoubtedly, there is a reason why this man chose me in a store full of people and a reason why he completely ignored the one person I was associated with and having a conversation with. So why me? This man did not know anything about me. He didn't know my name. He didn't know whether or not I was a good person and he barely even knew if I would be interested in a Christmas ornament in the first place. The only thing that he could gather about my identity was that I was a wheelchair user and likely disabled. And that was enough. The simple fact that I was a disabled person was enough of an incentive for that man to buy something for me. Normally, giving gifts is a selfless act, it's a way for people to bond, a way to communicate with others, and a way to let people know you care about them. However, this particular situation remained unsettling to me. It felt like a halfway transaction. This instance, which is not just a symptom of my own physical condition, reminded me of how hyper-visible I am. It reminded me that I am exceptionally abnormal it reminded me that people are watching me. It reminded me that people feel bad for me. It reminded me that there are some people who would rather get the guilt for my existence off of their shoulders by making them feel better about themselves and their situation. I often think about how differently I would have felt if this man had just taken a moment to talk about what I was doing that day, what Christmas ornaments caught my eye, or even about my disability in general. Oftentimes, the gift of genuine conversation and laughter is worth so much more than just a physical gift. And it's often moments like the encounter that I experienced in the store that make disabled people like me feel frustrated. We see good intentions and meet lovely people, but we ache for a moment where we can feel just like everyone else 
and we ache for a moment in which our sense of character matters uniquely to others. To brighten someone's day, you normally wouldn't just buy them something that you'd think they'd want or need. You would try to get to know them more, ask how they're feeling, what their interests are, and maybe even what they wish for. Disabled people are no exception to this idea. We value personal connections and social belonging more than physical gifts or random words of praise. It may be important to consider before performing a kind action why you are doing it. Confirm with yourself if your method for executing your favor is the best method to bond with someone else. Some good deeds benefit everyone, others benefit only some people. Some good deeds resonate for long periods of time, while others offer temporary reassurance. Some are even misguided and attempt to bring light to situations that are not as awful as they seem. Others perpetuate discrimination issues. Over the years, the profile of ableism has shifted and warped due to changing cultural experiences and technologies. Much of the disabled experience is documented over the internet and television by those who are not disabled. Disabled people want to be involved in the ableism conversation as well, and it's important to invite them to report on experiences and their concerns for themselves. From spots in decision-making boards and committees to job positions in the press, allowing disabled people to offer valuable input would increase the credibility of inclusivity-related resources to the public. The disabled archetype in the media often triggers a paternal instinct in people. Take a moment to think about how you felt the last time you watched a feel-good story of a disabled person receiving a good deed. Maybe these stories made you feel happy that you weren't in their position. Maybe these stories made you feel happy that someone finally became the bigger person to help them. You may also recall stories of people overcoming their disability to do something that they love. There are countless articles out there documenting disabled heroes that never let their disability define them. However, this can make disabled people like me feel that our natural interests and hobbies are simply extraordinary because we are disabled. Disability is part of us. It has shaped our worldview and is often a celebrated part of our identity. Sometimes we want to be praised for the personal risks that we take and other adventures that we choose to embark on. I have osteogenesis imperfecta, known as riddle bone disease. It affects the collagen in my body, making my bones extremely fragile and easily broken. I can't participate in certain physical activities or else I could be injured. After witnessing the operations and injuries I've gone through, and after telling them about my condition, my friends kind of became traumatized. Even teachers would tell them to be hypervigilant around me. People stopped inviting me to places and asking me to hang out with them. When I asked them about how their birthday parties went, they would apologize for not inviting me and said it was because they didn't think I could participate. Ableism is taught. It is not intrinsic. The tendency for people to distance themselves from the topic of ableism while also trying to strive through inclusivity overcomplicates the process. Many times, People attempt to advocate through those, with those with disabilities through performative activism. Inspiration culture refers to the ecosystem of positive posts, media stories, and news headlines that we consume to make our days feel brighter. Sometimes we look to these stories to say to ourselves, at least I'm not them, or at least my life isn't as bad as their life is. Virtue signaling occurs when someone publicly demonstrates their goodwill to promote a better image of themselves, which positively reflects the reputation. 
These concepts promote a change in social behaviors by only creating bite-sized and shallow methods of solving the problem. Sometimes it is easier to create the illusion of social change by monitoring the amount of acts of kindness completed. Sometimes it is easier to create this illusion by monitoring likes and shares on social media. One of Dharman's many videos on his YouTube channel, Disabled Girl Humiliates Disabled Girl, She Regrets It, receives support from able-bodied critics, but huge amounts of backlash from disabled content creators. From oversimplifying problems that disabled people face to misrepresenting the complexities of ableism, this film did not accurately represent the complexities of the disabled community, and it perpetuated the misguided belief that ableism is easily recognizable and easy to solve. Darman was able to make his projects better by including disabled people and assisting him with making his skits. Disabled is a big and vague word, but disabled does not have to be a bad word. Yes, there are some specific conditions and illnesses that cause great suffering for some people. However, the term disabled does not supply enough information as to what condition a person has or what their quality of life is. Using the term disabled helps alert the people around us of our limitations and need for accessibility related resources. Some people may interpret the phrases limitations and disability as being inherently upsetting when it does not have to be that way. What makes this pessimistic mindset harmful is that it can encourage people to mitigate the disabled identity. Disabled people will likely keep existing for a very long time. Therefore, we need to focus less on fixing disability itself and more on learning from disabled people how to provide them access to the outside world. Yes, there are some conditions that cause great suffering and distress for some people and affect their quality of life, but there are also able-bodied people who also have a low quality of life. The social hardships are not the fault of being disabled. It's the fault of people who don't take the time to be understanding and learn how to help. When I think about ableism, I think about the time a friend of mine encouraged me to play basketball with him. And when I told him it's unsafe for me, he told me to just believe in myself in the way that disabled people are supposed to. In these situations, it's much more helpful to trust disabled people for figuring out how to provide them access to the outside world in a much better way by listening to them and trusting their recommendations to protect and help themselves. When I think about ableism, I think about those news stories of disabled people getting invited to prom by the popular kid to only hang out with them for one night for the praise and attention before never speaking to them again. In these situations, it's much more helpful to include people in your social circle after the night is through and when no one is around to praise your act of kindness. When I think about ableism, I think about employers denying disabled people jobs because they don't ask, what can you do? Or what accommodations would you need to function in this workplace? It's time to allow people and disabled people to participate in the fight for their own quality of life. Discrimination did not end with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. So let's continue the conversation with disabled people included. One of the most prolific slogans in the disability movement has been coined by James I. Charlton's book, Nothing About Us Without Us. And if you, any of you are wondering, yes, the Christmas ornament that the man gave to me did end up on my tree. Thank you. I think we have a lot to learn and listen as a community. So thank you, Angeline, for your powerful talk. Now I'd like to present a new question to the audience. Are you a leader? 
When we ask that question, we think about characteristics that typically associate with leaders. We think about being charismatic, being outgoing, and maybe even being funny. But when we really think about it, we want someone who's hardworking, responsible, diligent, and the list goes on. In fact, there are a lot of qualities that we have, but we feel like we don't fit the common archetype of a leader. Our next speaker, Priyal Shaw, will show us the attributes and demonstrate how we can become a leader that is inside of, inside of us all. Priyal is a campus leader and a student here at Rutgers Camden, where she is a member of the Student Wellness Advisory Board and a treasurer of the South Asian Appreciation for Tradition and Heritage. Her talk is titled, Be Brave. I took this really interesting course my first semester of college, Psychology of Personality, where my professor was talking about this theory of leadership I found really interesting. She mentioned how there was no right way to be a leader but it was more about the different qualities and mannerisms we bring to make it our own version of perfect leadership. She called it the situational theory of leadership, where the type of leader is dependent on the situations that you or I would be in. She said that this leadership is more about learning on the job. So the more exposed we are to varying situations, the stronger our impact would be as a leader, simply because we're reinforcing our skill set. So my question is, how can we learn from these qualities and trigger these qualities in our daily lives? I turn to some of the great leaders throughout history, Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, and Indira Gandhi. With these impactful people, I wanted to see what exactly was the key to their experiences that brought out their best qualities and how we could be successful like them in our own lives. I created the BRAVE Leadership acronym, which touches on the key attributes of a great leader who is self-aware and who is able to bounce back from failures, who is able to face life's uncertainties and connects and engages with people around them. And this can be summarized to the key attributes of being brave, balanced, resilient, adaptable, versatile, and engaged. The BRAVE Leadership acronym accounts for leaders who improve capabilities, overcome uncertainties, and deliver exceptional results where the heart and mind are focused. Now, this leadership is not about the individual traits that are mentioned, but in fact, the culmination of these traits to drive positive results. Like the I have a dream speech to vouch for a nation void of racism and segregation, or being the conductor of the Underground Railroad, granting slaves their freedom or even being elected the first female prime minister of India, despite national discriminations. I decided to test this formula out in my life to see the advancements and limitations of these traits as a leader. As a certified EMT, our mission is our patient's safety and compassionate delivery of quality care with every emergency. We find a way to work together to save the lives of those when they hang in the balance, whether it be at a major car accident or the need for resuscitation. Their lives are in our hands, and it is in moments like these where their survival relies on the activation of our leadership skills. So I had this one call during the pandemic where a patient was having a diabetic episode and needed to be transported immediately. I decided to implement the BRAVE model here to test the advancements. I had to make sure our team was balanced by making sure we all had the knowledge and skills necessary to help treat our patient. After assigning roles to each team member, we checked the patient's vital signs and glucose levels. And to avoid diabetic shock, we decided to transport. Now, once we were in the ambulance, we had to be resilient and adaptable in making sure our patient was calm, conscious, and alert by keeping them comfortable in the stretcher, providing them with the proper medications, and of course, preparing for any adverse results that could occur. Next, we had to be versatile in adapting to the patient's fluctuating vital signs and engage with the patient to make sure they were communicating all the information needed to better treat them. Now, in this one scenario, I was able to apply all of the brave leadership traits as I continued to learn to be a better leader. Now, the brave leadership traits can be applied and cover all of the bases for personal success, which can then be imprinted onto team success. 
So the question you all probably have now is, how does this help me? How can I be brave in my life and still attain my goals? The brave leadership model can be applied to our current pandemic world. A common challenge we are all facing is the lack of time management and boundaries in a digital world. There have been many conversations about working remotely, in person, and even a hybrid format, which is disrupting our daily routines. Not only that, but while working remotely has its benefits, it is forcing our work lives to bleed into our personal lives, illustrating a lack of differences between the two. To top it all off, with the increased limitations we have had in our in-person interactions, it has been very difficult to form meaningful connections with our peers, mentors, and colleagues. So let's revisit these situations once again, this time applying the brave leadership model to make subtle yet meaningful changes. Now the lack of consistency in a virtual world is difficult to change because there's so many unpredictable circumstances. However, we can be brave by creating multiple routines that factor in for the different working formats we are placed with. This may entail taking a scheduled break in the morning or the evening, depending on your schedule, or having meetings earlier in the morning rather than later so you have more free time. This allows you to be flexible yet approachable, creating the perfect environment for all working formats. Now we know that having a work-life balance is difficult, but there are things that we can do to change this too. We can create fixed working hours or have new timelines when tasks are not done in a timely manner and be present and engage with every task we dwell in. This allows us to be flexible, yet allows us to create boundaries and attending to each aspect of our life equally and efficiently. Now we know being virtual is difficult and these connections are even harder to form through a screen, but we can be brave by having group FaceTime calls with friends and family members or finding a hobby and volunteering with people who have similar interests or being connected and engaged through video calls and team building activities with our mentors. The brave leadership traits can be applied to so many aspects of our life. It is about expanding our mindset and playing an active role in determining our approach to this leadership. So I mentioned a few ways that we can use brave in our daily lives and using these every day can open new opportunities for us on a larger scale as well. For example, I have a friend who suffers from major food allergies. She and her sister are allergic to many ingredients in prepackaged foods, but they're often not labeled correctly, causing many health problems for both of them. They were brave in their approach to create a change and have Congress successfully expand the definition of a major food allergen to include sesame. They created the Got Your Back initiative to raise awareness in their high schools and support and turned this self-advocacy into state advocacy by having meetings with congressional members through a congressional fly-in at Washington, D.C. They were brave in their approach to create a solution for this problem. And although there were many factors that inhibited their success, they went through all of it and became successful. Oftentimes, when they were discussing their talks with the congressional members and their representatives, there was a lack of understanding and their ideas were dismissed because they didn't know why there was a need for this bill. However, they were resilient and adaptable by using their personal experiences to educate and show how important and crucial this bill was for the food allergy community. Even COVID-19 impacted them as they had to have congressional meetings over Zoom. But regardless, they persevered through it all and they were successful in implementing BRAVE to pass this bill. So as you can see, the BRAVE leadership model can be applied to any aspect of our life with any lengths, from creating work-life balance to tangible differences in Congress. We just have to find our passion. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to storm the doors of Congress and be brave to create change. There are so many things that go into creating a difference. And I would know this firsthand as I go through this every day in my life, from my classes to work, to even my involvements on campus. As humans, we tend to focus more on the negative rather than the positive things in our life. But really, it is these negative aspects that we are exposed to that kind of focus and incline on the negative things. What is important to remember is that we are in the driver's seat. It is about changing the perception of leadership in that there's no such thing as a perfect leader. If anything, 
It is the differences in our leadership that make success more achievable and attainable. Now, as a community, there's a general perception that there is a right or perfect path to becoming a leader and that making mistakes and having flaws is what leads us to a lack of success. But the reality is that it is these mistakes and flaws that make our leadership more relatable and stronger. Because the truth is, nobody's perfect. The BRAVE leadership acronym accounts for and celebrates these flaws as we create our unique stamp on what a leader looks like. Now, everybody is leading their own lives, and we become the narrators of our own stories. It is about us taking an active role in our lives and the lives of those we surround ourselves with, whether it be our friends, family, or mentors. We need to go out and create the stories that we set out to write, to be the brave leaders they can look to for role models as for advice, because we create tangible differences that they can see and look up to. We now have the formula for success, and it is time to take action and implement these changes. Speak up at your next Zoom meeting to connect with your peers and colleagues, or create a meeting with your, with your manager to have boundaries in your work and balance. Or teach your kid how to use an Instapot so then they can make a meal for themselves when you're unable to do so. Seek out opportunities in your life when you can be brave, balanced, resilient, adaptable, versatile, and engaged. Our differences are what makes success more attainable, and it is the brave leadership model that can use to be successful. Are you ready to be a brave leader with me? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our conference, and we hope you enjoyed the first half of the conference. Please use the five minutes of this break to grab food, stretch, and fill out some of the forms we have linked below in the description. Additionally, feel free to comment on what brand new ending means to you in the chat. We'll see you soon.
Welcome back everyone. So I have a question for you all to answer in the chat below. How many of you have read a poem today? Or maybe this week? How about this month? Now I have a similar question for you. How many of you have read a poem that has deeply affected you? You may not even remember the name. It could be just a stanza or even just a couple of words that has stuck with you over time. Poetry is a bit different than other forms of art. This art form can impact us in unique and powerful ways, especially when it comes to our relationships. To elaborate on this is relationship and poetry alchemist Marie Elizabeth Malie, whose works have been featured in Forbes, Sway, and Thrive Global. Her talk today is titled, Navigating Love, Loss, and Life Through Poetry. I'm in love. I feel connected and happy. I can see spending the rest of our lives together. And yet, there's also a part of me that knows I could blow it all up at any moment because opening myself to this depth of love is so confronting. When I say I love you, I mean you are the cyclone in my Coney Island, the hirsute giant in my tent, my snakeskin boy. When you say I love you, you mean you place your heart on a dartboard. Let me take 10 throws. I mean I hand you a shotgun and toss my clay pigeon heart in the air. I mean hot coals and bare feet, a day at the beach, no sunscreen. You mean every time I swing the mallet, the bell clangs and I win another pink rabbit. You mean you can catch every ball thrown from any angle at any speed. When I say I love you, I mean I built you a raft out of matches and hair, lay down on it naked, and handed you the strike pad. My poem, Strike Anywhere, portrays the thrill and risk of love, how vulnerability can feel like you're turning yourself into a human dartboard and inviting someone to pierce your heart like only they can. While falling in love is a euphoric, unsustainable high during which even the sappiest love poems seem to convey the deepest truths, we all know that sustaining and deepening love over time is a more complicated and nuanced endeavor. The best love poems contain that complexity and nuance, like Pablo Neruda's love sonnet number 17 from his wildly popular book, 100 Love Sonnets, with lines like, Te amo como se aman ciertas cosas oscuras, secretamente, entre la sombra y el alma. His love sonnets have been popular for decades because they ring true, and they give voice to the mysterious and the mundane, the full range of passionate long-term love. Because over time in our relationships, sentimentality and surface-level platitudes just don't cut it. Reading poetry helps us navigate the tides of our relationships with less shame about the inevitable changes and more curiosity and openness. In this way, poetry turns an ending, getting mired in shame about the need for change, into an opening, being curious about the truth of our lived experience. In reality, the ending of a poem or a relationship both shuts a door and opens a window. One of our jobs in life might be to learn how to look better through the window instead of constantly banging our heads on the door. When someone's getting a divorce, I often share Jack Gilbert's poem, Failing and Flying, which begins with the lines, everyone forgets that Icarus also flew. It's the same when love comes to an end and ends with, I believe Icarus was not failing as he fell, but just coming to the end of his triumph. He turns one of our most shame-inducing endings, divorce, into an opening, offering the reader the point of view that even true love could have an arc 
and that knowing when a specific love's triumph is coming to an end is as much to a success to be celebrated as is staying married for the rest of one's life. This poem teaches us that a marriage is a success even if it ends in divorce, because if it's coming to the end of its triumph, we have to open to a change in its form to stay connected with its truth. This is a radical stance in a world where many of us hang on to relationships long past their expiration dates because we were raised on a steady diet of till death do us part being the only ending worth aspiring to. In most poetry, nothing is that black and white. The shades of nuance it holds are a more accurate reflection of who we are and how we live. Reading and sharing poetry with one another can also be an antidote to the intense polarization of our current moment because we can connect directly with another's interiority through the poem, an interiority we might deeply relate to even as the surface elements of our life and the writer's life might have nothing in common. In this way, poetry turns an ending of separation into an opening of connection President John F. Kennedy recognized the importance of poetry in personal and public life when he chose to have Robert Frost read a poem at his inauguration, the first poet to ever do so. In a 1964 article in The Atlantic, President Kennedy wrote, when power leads a man toward arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the area of man's concern, Poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses, for art establishes the basic human truths which must serve as the touchstones of our judgment. Amanda Gorman reminds us of important human truths in these lines from her recent inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. Poetry reveals new ways to see ourselves and each other clearly and holistically, since we're capable of incredible empathy and kindness, as well as unimaginable cruelty. What we each choose to do in the face of our complex capabilities makes all the difference in the depth of love and connection we get to have in our lives and the impact we get to make in the lives of others. We can choose through the mirror of a poem and the people we're in relationship with to encounter and get to know ourselves more fully and honestly. Without this reflection from the outside, it's hard to see ourselves clearly. Our blind spots and delusions get in the way, but bump up against a poem that moves us or a loved one's reaction and who we are beneath our well-curated selves gets laid bare in an instant. For this reason, we often turn to poetry to express ourselves at weddings, birthdays, funerals, and times of national tragedy, since it can be hard to find the right words to express how we feel on those momentous occasions, and a poem often gets to the heart of the matter better than prose. Reading the right poem at the right time can also be the thing that wakes us up to a new possibility for our life and relationships, one that we couldn't access before because we had our nose to the grindstone and were plodding down the well-worn path of familial and societal expectations. Because poetry is a made thing, which is what the word meant in ancient Greek, and a poet was defined as a maker of things, a poem invites us to slow down, to take in and feel the well-crafted images and rhythm of the words, and the way the line and stanza breaks flow down the page if we're reading instead of listening to it. What if we were to see our relationships as a made thing, recognizing that we too are makers of things with respect to our relationships, constantly crafting them into one experience or another, whether or not we realize day to day that we have the agency to do so. We're each writing a poem with our lives, whether we know it or not. So let's craft something true and beautiful with them.
We'd be so much more real with one another if we remembered that we could lose it all at any moment. If we allowed ourselves to feel how deeply we want to be seen and known before we're gone. We can allow love to be both euphoric and mundane. By becoming more true to ourselves and more authentic in our relationships, we give them a chance to become more complex and real and thereby more fulfilling. Our relationships can become the place we go to experience and express our aliveness and truth instead of being the place where our aliveness gets buried under the anvil of resentments and obligations. When we approach our relationships poetically, moments of love and joy are deepened and made sweeter by the awareness that loss could happen at any moment. And grief is made more bearable by remembering that joy will eventually return. Praise this beautiful, terrible world where we are opened and crushed, where the kiss comes from a mouth that bites. These lines are from my poem, The Diver. How do you hold the complexity of a world in which the part of our body we use to kiss and speak words of love is the same part of our body that tears apart our food and can cause harm by breaking someone's skin? I invite you to move through life from today forward, being more curious and welcoming of complexity, so that when you meet someone abrasive or different, or someone who behaves in a way that's not aligned with how you behave, instead of coming to a snap judgment and ending about them, you can, like a poet, choose to turn that ending into an opening. We can learn from poetry how to meet a complex world complex individuals and complex emotions with depth, imagination, and curiosity, which will transform how we relate to one another for the better. Thank you, Maria Elizabeth, for showing us that poetry can navigate us through loss, love, and life. Our next talk dives deep into the social awakenings to difficulties and dangers Black Americans face every day. In 2022, many Americans reacted to the blatant acts of discrimination and racism but, uh, Black Americans face every day. And many Americans have pledged their support in any way they could. Yet oftentimes, these acts of uh, violence and racism are only the tip of the iceberg, and this leaves us having a bigger conversation. Our next speaker, Dr. Oscar Holmes IV, who is an Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs, also Associate Professor of Management, and Ruse Director of, at Rutgers School of Business, Camden, will help illustrate the dangers Black Americans face and show us how our understanding can contribute to collective healing. His talk is titled, We Need to Talk About Police Brutality and the Less Conspicuous Ways Racism Kills Black People. My grandfather was the custodian of the rural public school I attended growing up. Like many black men of his time who grew up in a segregated and Jim Crow South, he couldn't read or write well. But I was so proud of my grandfather, and I loved the fact that I got to see him every day at school. At that young age, I was unaware of the different status privileges that people attached to others based on the type of job they held or their race. It didn't even bother me that I had to help my grandfather clean classrooms after school because it meant that when I was finished, my brother and I could go to the school gym and we could play with the other kids who were staying after school waiting on their parents to finish their work. But there's one day in middle school that I will never forget. And that was the day that I realized that I was black. My brother and I had finished helping our grandfather, so we had gone to the gym and we started playing basketball with another white brother team, a point that had always been irrelevant to me up until this day. We were putting all the moves on them, beating them badly. 
when the youngest brother stopped me at court and out of the blue yelled at me, give me the ball, you black boy. And just like that, it seemed that everything had stopped. Then it sped back up because before I knew it, I was choking that boy. His brother ran out of the gym, probably to get their mother. And my brother, who was equally as shocked as I was, finally snapped out of the trance that he was in and pulled me off of him. Now, it's not like we grew up not seeing color, because we did. And he actually said a true statement. I was a black boy. And don't get me wrong, I love being black. But it was the way that he said to me, you black boy. That was the first time in my life that I realized that to some people, there was something wrong with being black. And that they saw being black as inferior. Or in other words, they saw me as inferior to them. At that young age, I couldn't understand why some people would think that way. But as I got older, I not only learned more about anti-black racism academically, but I also experienced more of the harsh realities of how anti-black racism manifests in America. Black America was still suffering from the chain of other high-profile police shootings when in May 2020, we witnessed yet another one when George Floyd was murdered, leaving us with those eerily familiar last words of, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. There were a lot of things that bothered me about how some people and organizations responded to this tragic event. But what I found most curious is that so many people saw these acts of racism solely within the realms of police brutality. That is, they understood how racism kills black people through police brutality, but they didn't see the other less conspicuous ways that racism kills. And moreover, they didn't see themselves as perpetrators of that racism. Though disappointing, this is actually not a surprise to me because as a researcher, I've studied discrimination, bias, and oppression for over a decade. And I've written specifically about the many ways that racism kills black people. But here today, I will just share with you two of the less conspicuous ways. It is my hope that greater awareness of the less conspicuous ways that racism kills would serve as a starting point for people who not only want to see a positive change in our society, but who also want to be that positive change in our society. The first less conspicuous way that racism kills black people is the perennial expectation that black people absolve others for their racism. We saw this happen the same day George Floyd was murdered when a white woman called 911 and lied to the dispatcher, stating that an African-American man was threatening her. Knowing full well the power of her white womanhood and the imminent danger a black man would be in from a police call using this language. In reality, he only asked her to leash her dog, which was a requirement in the area of Central Park they were in. So she became known as Central Park Karen. You see, the weaponization of white femininity happens so often that Black America even has a name for it, Karen. We saw it happen when a white man walked into a South Carolina AME church during a Bible study meeting and later murdered the nine Black church parishioners in cold blood and he was brought Burger King food to eat while he was in police custody. We saw it happen when a white woman was on trial for killing her neighbor, Botham Jean, while he was just sitting in his own apartment. Coming off the stand, the victim's brother and the judge both 
gave her a hug. The judge even given her the Bible from her chambers. In all of these cases, the calls to forgive those white people were swift. And just like clockwork, forgiveness came. It doesn't matter how much pain we are in or the outcomes we face due to this racism. America demands us to forgive and forget so it can move on as business as usual. But as legendary activist Malcolm X reminds us, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, there's no progress. If you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. So the next time you see people urging black people to absolve and forgive others for their racism so that they can quickly jump to the happy hallmark ending that they expect and are comfortable with, stop them. And make sure the perpetrators are actually held accountable for their racist behavior and advocate for the appropriate restitution to black people to heal the blow. The second less conspicuous way racism kills black people is through performative activism and allyship. Now, typically, you can tell if something is performative if there is some constellation of these three factors. One, if there is an absence of a legitimate track record from the personal organization. Two, if there is a mismatch between behavior and activism goals. And three, if there is some presence of some self-interested gains. Take, for example, when Colin Kaepernick took a knee to protest anti-black racism, he ended up losing his job in the NFL. But after organizations jumped on the 2020 wave of racial reckoning, instead of hiring him back and addressing their own internal racial inequity issues, the NFL decided to play the black national anthem at the start of games. Like, who asked for that? The leaders at Twitter decided to make Juneteenth a corporate holiday. Now, that's a good start and all, but what about that edit tweet feature we've been asking about for forever? And if that's too much to ask, what about social media companies quickly shutting down the accounts of people who spew white supremacy across their social media platforms? And as a final example, Walmart, the largest retailer in the world, pledge to stop locking up their multicultural hair and beauty supplies in their display cases. Really, Walmart? Of all of the things you could have chosen to advance racial justice, you chose this one as your pledge? How about just stop profiling black customers as they shop in your stores? Or perhaps, how about pay all of your full-time store associates many of whom are women and people of color, adequate living wages so they wouldn't have to rely on government assistance just to make ends meet. These are just a small sample of the many ways in which people and organizations have engaged in performative activism and allyship. Now, some of you may ask, isn't doing some good better than doing nothing? Well, if the good that you're doing is performative, then it's not good at all. Performative activism and allyship is particularly nefarious because it diverts attention and resources away from legitimate people, causes, and organizations who are doing the real work to advance racial justice. And it maintains the status quo or worse, exacerbates the oppression that vulnerable communities are already experiencing. The research on minority stress, discrimination, and identity threat is clear on the many ways racism negatively impacts black people's mental, emotional, and physical health. Some people call it death by a thousand cuts. And what is also clear to me is if we frame this moment a racial reckoning, this moment that some people are calling the twin pandemics only as a police brutality issue, 
and overlook all of the less conspicuous ways that racism kills, we will fail miserably on moving the needle on eliminating racism in our society, and more black people will die. Now, my grandfather, who was my last surviving grandparent, passed away when I was in college, meaning that none of my grandparents lived long enough to see any of their children or grandchildren graduate from college. Like all of you, I want to see my grandchildren graduate from college and beyond, but I need your help to do it. Thank you. Dr. Holmes, that was such an important talk and a much needed conversation we need to have as a society. Thank you. As we sit with some of these ideas, we would like to bring Dylan back for another piece. We just cannot get enough of his talent and beautiful work. Once again, he showcases another piece for The Hungry Boy by Johnny Greenwood. What a work of art. Thank you again, Dylan. Next on our virtual stage is a talk about education. If we were to gather a group of A students and compare them with a group of C students, it would be impossible to compare this one quality, the desire to learn versus the desire to perform. Nowadays, getting an A is less representative of a quality of a student than ever. So why are we trying to hack our learning as if our education is a game to be won? perhaps because it's exactly designed this way. Our next speaker, Dr. I. Addison Zhang, will tell us how our grading system lies at the center of this win-lose design and how to return the spark of learning in our students and really prepare them for a better future. Dr. I. is a professor turned entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Classroom Without Walls. Her work has been featured on Forbes, Pearson Education, Higher Education, and so many other publications. Her talk is titled, School is Obsolete, What's Next? Growing up, I thought having good grades was what mattered the most to become a successful person. There was a lot of pressure in my community to succeed. The expectation for children was to earn not only A's, but A plus for every single course. In fact, as a young person, 
There were only three career options available to me. Doctor, lawyer, failure. So as an obedient daughter, I worked extremely hard to earn all the good grace because I didn't want to be perceived as a failure. I mean, who would? As a result, I became one of the hardest working students in all of my classes. Uh, indeed, I got all the A's possible, and I even managed to get a few degrees. In fact, I got the terminal degree in my field of study. There are literally no more degrees after a PhD. From the outside, I was probably every teacher's parent's dream student. But internally, I was collapsing. I felt paralyzed by the pressure to compete and succeed. The pressure was so intense that learning had become a chore and accumulation of points. School, as a result, had become a terrible cycle. Suffer, ace the exam, and repeat. I didn't realize how damaging this cycle was until I became a college professor. I started to see what I experienced as a student happening to my own undergraduate students in front of my eyes. The stress, the obsession with grace, the lack of spark in most students' eyes. After observing this for more than 10 years in the classroom, I finally came to the conclusion. I was part of the problem. What I was doing as a college professor was simply perpetuating a broken education model. Even more so, I discovered the thing that everyone cares so much about, aka grade, has little to do with anyone's career or life success. This may sound counterintuitive to you, but hear me out. Research has actually demonstrated an inverse relationship between great point average and innovation orientation. What this means is that the higher the grade, the less likely a student is interested in innovation. Besides hurting innovative intentions, studies have also shown that as students receive more formal schooling, they are actually becoming less curious and ask fewer questions in class. In fact, I saw what was suggested in all of those studies in my teaching career all the time. As a college professor of more than 10 years, the most commonly asked questions that I got were not necessarily intellectually stimulating questions related to what I was teaching in the classroom, but questions like this. Dr. I, will this be on the exam? Dr. I, if I don't do this, am I going to lose a point? Dr. I, can you please give us a template? Honestly, it felt quite miserable to be a teacher. However, I want to make it very clear that this is not to blame our teachers or students. In fact, this is nobody's fault. What we see here is simply a product of an antiquated education system. The system is obsolete. What needs to be fixed is not our teachers or students, but the system. The system is broken. Interestingly, in contrast to the system's obsession with grace, academic achievement, new hiring trends are actually emerging. More and more companies are devaluing the importance of grace. For example, the head of people operations at Google shared in an interview with the New York Times that GPAs are worthless as a hiring criteria and test scores are worthless. In fact, 15 
Major companies no longer require college degrees in their hiring, including Google, IBM, and Starbucks. Elon Musk even tweeted to work for Tesla. He doesn't even care if you graduate high school or not. In addition to this trend to devalue the importance of degrees and grades, industry sectors and companies are launching their own career certificates. Last year, Google launched their own career certificates to replace the traditional four-year college for several high-demand positions. I predict it will only be a matter of time for other industry sectors and companies to catch up on this trend. The bottom line is no one cares about your grade. So here is the bigger question. If grades do not matter, what does matter? Here is what I discovered after working with more than 2,000 students over the course of the last 15 years. My biggest aha discovery was that school-based learning was only a small portion of what was needed to help a young person become career-ready, life-ready, and future-ready. That's why I developed the iceberg model to help parents, students, and educators understand the missing links in the current education model and what we must supplement outside the classroom. Through my own learning, I discovered three key factors to anyone's career and life success. Those three factors include knowledge, life literacy, and mindset. Traditional schools only focus on academic knowledge, which is simply the tip of the iceberg to help a young person become career ready and life ready. What really keeps the iceberg afloat is life literacy and mindset. Life literacy consists of digital media literacy and five essential life skills, which are communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and creative problem solving. Digital media literacy describes a student's ability to use social media to create and to effectively and creatively showcase a student's skills and expertise and maybe even monetize them. Because if Google cannot find you, you do not exist. We are entering today's show me economy. The five essential life skills are what our students need to become future leaders. And those essential life skills simply cannot be developed by sitting in the classroom, taking exams, and regurgitating information. They have to be cultivated in real life and through real life examples. There is a big difference between scoring an A in a communication course, for example, versus demonstrating excellent communication skills in real life. Mindset is the engine driving the entire iceberg toward career success. Thousands of students that I have worked with in the past have the mentality that failures and mistakes are bad and should be avoided at all costs. However, if you interview any successful person, they will tell you that rejections, failures, and mistakes were the stepping stones to their career success. So if our students continue to have the mentality that failures and mistakes are bad and should be avoided, how can we expect them to have the resilience to become future leaders? We need to normalize failures. We need to normalize mistakes in the classroom. And even more so, we need to teach our students how to self-regulate when they do fail, when they do make a mistake. Unfortunately, the current education system doesn't do that, other than punishing failures and mistakes. 
However, our education model did do an excellent job in terms of labeling our students and perpetuating those labels through stratification and our outdated evaluation system. Those labels tend to stay with our students for a long time and eventually become their identities. Unfortunately, hardly any school curriculum teaches our students how to navigate through those labels by tapping into the power of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity describes humans' ability to literally rewire our brain. As the word indicates, our brain is quite plastic. With the right tools and strategies, we can rewire our brain and remove those labels and shift our mindset from a fixed one to a growth one. So how can we best implement this revised education model? I developed a three-phase process to implement this model and to help a young person become career ready and future ready and life ready. The first phase is called preparation, which involves unlearning old practices and beliefs that are no longer serving today's students. The second phase is called creation, which is the core of this roadmap that I'm going to dive deeper in a second. The third phase is called acceleration, which combines a mastery of essential life skills and growth mindset. So let's talk about creation. I believe creation is the highest level of learning and the key to solving today's education problems and the key to preparing our students to become future ready and career ready. Over the last several years, I have tested quite a number of creation-focused projects. There's one project that is generating transformational change in my students. It is an interview-based live streaming project. I have tested this project on hundreds of students and across a wide range of disciplines. The results are clear. This interview-based live streaming project is one of the best ways to help our students gain career clarity and develop essential life skills, like the five C's that we talked about before, which are communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and creative problem solving. Plus, this project involves our students using social media tools that they are already using. However, this project flips the coin on social media. Instead of allowing social media to use our students, this project empowers our students to use social media to serve their own career and professional needs. There's a big difference. Plus, there's no better way to connect with our students than being on platforms that they already use. There is a famous quote. Tell me, I forget. Teach me, I may remember. Involve me, and I learn. Do you still remember the stuff that your teachers taught you last year or the year before? <laughs> if you are like me and the most learners, you probably don't remember. If we don't learn like this, why do we teach like this? Thank you, Dr. I, for your valuable insights on the education system. Many of us know this phrase, two negatives don't equal a positive. Throughout the history of humankind, two opposing forces have continually hung over our existence, what we know versus what we believe. Malika Mahmood, a scientific researcher and undergraduate student at Rutgers University Camden, will dive headfirst into the relationship between the seen 
and the unseen, our place within it, and whether these two powerful forces are truly even opposed at all. I invite you to be researchers and curious individuals yourself as she explores these weighty questions and presents to us her discoveries thus far. I am excited to introduce to you Having Faith in Science by Malaika Mahmood. What do you think of when you hear the word science? Maybe you think of biology, chemistry, lab coats, or even the funny face of Einstein. But I bet you the last thing you would ever consider is religion. We treat religion and science a lot like baking soda and vinegar, never to be combined because of the explosion they create. We view science as something that is objective and religion as subjective. Science is something that is factual and observable, whereas religion is just based on belief. However, our perception of these two are wrong. In reality, these two disciplines are more like hydrogen and oxygen. We need both. Religion has the proclaimed statements, and science is the evidence that can prove it. We can utilize religious texts in science to further our endeavors in understanding the world, from atomic interactions to how our minds function. Now, I am not here to convince anyone to believe in God or to be religious. I'm simply here to explain how religion can aid us in our scientific discoveries. How is this possible though? Because for a very long time, science and religion have been butting heads. Well, I'm here to tell you that this so-called radical idea that religion and science are co-partners is not radical at all. In fact, when you look at many religions, they promote the unity of these two fields, from Christianity, to Judaism, to Buddhism, to Islam, you name it. All of them are encouraging their followers to go into science to understand the world. In fact, one of the periods in time where these two were coexisting was during the Islamic Golden Age. People of all faiths and backgrounds worked side by side and produced many great discoveries. For instance, it was found during this time that the reason we can see objects is because of light bouncing off of them and entering our eyes. Many great discoveries like these were made, and just as those of different faiths coexisted, so did science and religion. Unfortunately, after the fall of this era, many of the work was lost, and eventually the world began to view religion and science as two opposing fields, leading our society today to be divided on these matters. But there are and have been scientists who advocate for the band of religion and science, and in fact proved that the two complement one another. Who is a famous scientist then that has dared to dabble in these hot waters? Well, one of them was Sir Isaac Newton, the same Newton who discovered things like the three laws of motion. He actually tested the statements of the Bible against his experiments. He wanted to understand the truth of God, and through his calculations, he never observed a contradiction in religion and science. In fact, his life goal was to help people believe in God through his work, because what he saw was a well-ordered system of the universe that pointed to a creator. There are many religious texts that speak about the phenomenons of our world. Another example of this is the Vedas. 
It alludes to the idea of gravity in Vashishka Sutra, which states, action of body and its members is also from conjunction with the hand, explaining that once the hand moves away, the object will fall. These verses are like riddles for us to guide our thinking and unravel the acts of nature. Now, a scientist from a modern era who proved that religion and science are a duo was a Nobel laureate in physics named Dr. Abdus Salam. He won the Nobel Prize for his contribution to the electroweak unification theory, which basically states that electromagnetic and weak nuclear force can merge and be a single interaction called electroweak interaction. He was able to make this discovery with the Quran, which speaks about beauty, symmetry, and harmony of the universe. Maybe you're wondering though, who recently has been able to show how religion can aid us in science? Well, I have. I utilize religion in science when I participated in a science fair. I wanted to understand why there is chorality and sidedness in nature. I wondered why at a molecular level, there is a preference of one kind of spin over the other. Like why molecules of lemons spin to the right, but molecules of oranges spin to the left. It is not understood why these preferences exist. So that is when I refer to the Quran for some possible explanations. The Quran has tons of verses that talk about the right side more often than the left. We as Muslims are told to commence good things from the right side, such as eating. From this, I theorize that maybe the purpose of chorality is along the lines of Darwin's phenomenon of survival of the fittest, meaning that each rotation might have its own set of capabilities that the other does not have, leading to explain why we see these biases in nature. Even though I did not have the tools to test this out, I did walk away with more clarity in understanding this complex question. It is true though, that there are many religious texts whose ideals possibly conflict with each other. But these variances are valuable because science is a melting pot. Dr. Salam stated, there is only one universal science. Its problems and modalities are international and there is no such thing as Islamic science, just as there is no Hindu science, no Jewish science, no Confucian science, nor Christian science. In other words, science needs multiple perspectives to solve multifaceted problems. Though there may be these differences, there is also a common thread among many religions. When you look at the beginnings of human history, where there were no means of communication and people lived in complete isolation, in each of those countries, there was some sort of religion. Though isolated from each other, somehow these various religions had the unanimous unity in the belief that some form of higher beings exist. This is impressive, considering how difficult it is today to get our own siblings to agree with us. My point is that the basis of many, if not all religions are similar. Let's take the Big Bang Theory as an example. Many religious texts allude to the beginnings of the universe and the continuous expansion of it. In Taoism specifically, it speaks about how the universe formed from two opposing forces, yin and yang. Sounds a bit similar to what science now theorizes, which is that the universe came from a tiny, hot, concentrated point, which exploded and spread out. These commonalities 
give us more reasons to study religion and science. And religion, as we have just seen, can help give some clarity and insight. We're now going to do an experiment where we're going to look at specifically how religious texts aid us in science. We're going to take a look at how the Quran, for instance, gives us insight on how our vision works. There's a verse in the Quran that states, Proofs have indeed come to you from your Lord. So whoever sees, it is for his own good. And whoever becomes blind, it is to his own harm. And I am not a guardian over you. This is stating that if we stop using our vision, we can become blind. Then there's another verse that says, those who have disbelieved, it being equal to them, whether thou warn them or warn them not, they will not believe. Allah has set a seal on their hearts and their ears, and over their eyes is a covering, and for them is a great punishment. This is explaining that if we stop using our vision, we can become permanently blind. Now, how does science support this? Well, Three scientists named Sperry, Hubble, and Weasel were able to show that in order for vision to develop, the eye needs to be exposed to continuous visual stimuli. So if one eye is closed for only a few days, there are permanent changes that occur in the visual cortex. And they found that if they did this for a long period of time, it leads to near blindness. There are many critics that question the role of religion and science and wonder why we should even incorporate it in science now. My response to that is, if you have both your eyes, why use only one of them? Science and religion are our lenses in seeing and understanding the world. So why only look at it from one angle? If we can utilize the works of philosophers like Plato and Aristotle in science, then why can't we do the same with religious texts? The greats before us, like Newton, encourage this unity. However, as a society, we chose to ignore this, even with the evidence in front of us. And the consequences have led to a great division in religion and science but we can make a brand new ending by learning from our past, just as we do when we look up at the stars. One of our basic human desires is for the quest of knowledge and to seek clarity. Whether that is to understand challenges in our personal lives or the problems we face as a society. Adding this new merge perspective can give us more insight and widen our vision. It can give us a deeper understanding of the challenges we face, such as mental health, quality of education, and even climate change. As a globalized world, we need to unite so we can find solutions to complex issues in science, politics, or any subject. Imagine just how much more progress we can make together. As Albert Einstein once said, Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Thank you. What a meaningful message, Malaika. I certainly hadn't thought of science and religion just being two sides of one coin. With our next talk, we'll see how making decisions isn't just with the flip of a coin, but rather asking ourselves questions seriously. I'll start off by asking, what good decisions have you made this week? We're forced with so many decisions every single day that making just one is a moral victory in and of itself. But a good decision is like a seed. It has to be watered to bear fruit. So how on earth do we track all of these decisions, know their purpose, and see through them? To answer this question, we have Dr. Bisseline Atley. After experiencing this dilemma herself, she set out, to examine how we approach mental health and decision-making. She's a naturopathic doctor 
who wants to change the way we approach mental health, as well as the director of her own virtual clinic, the Mental Empowerment Center. She offers some of her insights with us today in her talk titled, Step Outside of the Mind to Build Great Mental Health. Is your life set up for happiness or for sadness? If you had asked me that question when I was 16 years old, I would have said sadness in a heartbeat. At that time, I was diagnosed with depression. My doctor gave me a prescription for what he called happy pills and sent me on my way. I didn't take his prescription too seriously because I didn't know what this happy felt like. Plus, I was a good student, an athlete, an involved member of my community. My friends and family loved me. My brother only kind of, but I was okay with that. So I said, no, I can get through this on my own. But when I ended up in the hospital in my second year of university, I realized that I can't get through this on my own. Here I was, a 19-year-old girl with big dreams, and now a completely destroyed life. So I decided right then and there in the hospital that things needed to change. The best part about hitting rock bottom is that there's nowhere to go but up. I started taking an antidepressant. I went to therapy. Thank you, Lindsay from Waterloo. I researched mental health and wellness online for hours and hours. Trust me when I say I was trying here. If I had tried this hard in university, I could have graduated with like a 5.0 GPA. I was eating right, exercising, had a full social life, meditating, journaling. My broken relationships were even repaired. I even tried to fit into group therapy. While other girls talked about their boyfriends, I talked about the closest thing I had to a relationship at that time, which was with my dog, Java. I was desperate here. Things seemed to be getting better, but my mental health still wasn't where I wanted it to be. It was frustrating. I had moments of joy, but they were short-lived. That's when I realized that I was focusing too much on my mind. Everything that I was doing was designed to make my mind happy. I was eating right for my mind. I was taking an antidepressant to fix the so-called imbalances in my mind. I was building healthy relationships for my mind. I was exercising for my mind. I wasn't living for myself anymore. I was living for my mind. So I stopped. I broke out of the shell that was my mind. I dissected my life and started becoming aware of the faulty systems that I had set up that were contributing to my sadness instead of my happiness. Here is an example of what it's like to stay in the mind. It's like the girl who's doing everything right, but then she constantly calls her ex-boyfriend for support even though he cheated on her multiple times and left her for her best friend, then wondering why nothing ever goes her way and why she's still so depressed. Is this a personal example from possibly seven years ago? Maybe. The point is that it doesn't matter if you go through the motions and behaviors of what you're supposed to do to have a healthy mind if you overlook the details of your life that are preventing your long-term happiness systems from forming. What's the point of waking up in the morning and making a healthy, strong for your mind breakfast if you're going to wake up in the morning rushed and scarf it down in a minute? You have absorbed nothing nutritious from that meal because your body is in fight or flight mode. What's the point of setting up social systems for support because it's good for your mind if you're not going to reach out when you need help? What's the point of forcing yourself to the gym to exercise, but you hate it, but it's good for your mind? There are more enjoyable ways of working out. It's these little details of our lives that we tend to overlook that are preventing our long-term happiness systems from forming and have more to do with us helping ourselves versus our minds. After this awareness, I started to transform my life. I stepped into the role of Picasso, picked up a paintbrush and started to paint a new system that would connect my broken pieces together. I really want you to experience what this is like. 
we're going to go on a journey together where you will get to feel what a morning with a happiness system setup feels like versus one with a not so happy setup. Let's start with the not so happy setup. The alarm clock rings and you immediately snooze it. Maybe once or maybe twice because wow, does your bed feel comfortable. Some time passes by and you look over at your clock with groggy eyes and you immediately jump out of bed because if you don't get ready in the next 10 minutes, you will be late. You get dressed in a rush, barely looking at what you're wearing. Your mind is already on overdrive with all the things that you need to get done today. Maybe you have a minute to eat breakfast or maybe you don't because there are other people that need your support this morning. Either way, you're already angry, annoyed, irritable, and stressed. It feels like nothing ever goes your way and you wish you could just crawl back into bed. Everything seems like it's taking forever, whether it be your kids getting dressed or your coffee dripping into your pot. You finally leave your home to go to work or school or maybe you go to the room next to you because you work from home. You sigh thinking, <sighs> Here we go, another day. What a morning, eh? I'll pass on that one. Let's go through with the morning with a happiness system set up. Pay attention to what details feel different. The alarm clock rings and you wake up on time. Or actually, maybe even a little bit earlier so that you can spend the first few minutes of your day doing what makes you feel good. Maybe you journal or meditate or work on one of your favorite hobbies. You get dressed in something you love. You make yourself a yummy, good for your mind breakfast and your body is beaming with the feel that you gave it. Not only do you have time to eat breakfast, but now you can also give proper support to other members of your family if they need it. Your mind starts to think about all the things that you need to get done today, but you're able to bring yourself back into the present moment. You're able to calmly go through the motions of the morning. You leave your home to go to work or school, or maybe you go to the room next to you because you work from home. You don't need to rush. You intentionally created a system that would allow you to have enough time to get settled in. You smile thinking, here we go, another day. You are ready and you know you can handle any challenge that comes your way. I really wanted to go through this experience with you so that you could feel the radically different feelings produced from each day. You can create your own happiness system. You get to be the Picasso of your life just like I became for my life. I made the decision at 20 to live my life as intentionally as possible. And yes, I definitely immediately cut that boyfriend out of my life. Here are the steps that I took and that I've helped my patients take. Step one, step outside of your mind. Step two, dissect your life from the moment that you wake up to the moment that you go to bed. Step three, Ask yourself if every single thing you are doing is contributing to a system of happiness or sadness. Step four, if things come up during your day that contribute to a system of sadness, change your perspective. Step five, change your behaviors to form a system of happiness. How? Do the opposite of what you're doing right now. Do you currently snooze your alarm clock in the morning? wake up on time. Do you have other people to take care of and you do it all by yourself but it's stressing you out? Ask for help. I've experimented with different systems to see what works for me. When I worked at a psychology clinic last year, my family knew not to speak with me until I had taken my post-work bath. This of course was created after countless fights and binge eating sessions of kettle chips. A patient I worked with, we'll call her Anne, was a second year university student who couldn't handle exam stress. Anne was exercising, eating right, going to therapy, but every time exams would come around, she would have a breakdown. Anne became aware that her system during exams wasn't set up for her happiness. We worked together to develop strategies that will allow her to better manage her stress. She started to schedule fun things to do during her breaks. She strengthened her social networks and she became comfortable with the natural anxiety that comes from stressful times. 
It's when Anne started to develop a daily system of happiness that her mental health changed. This process is more than just eating right, sleeping right, moving more, fixing chemical imbalances, addressing childhood traumas. This is about you. Looking at your life with a critical lens and asking yourself if it is truly set up for you to be as happy as possible. We cannot go back and create a brand new beginning in terms of how we approach mental health care, but we can create a brand new ending by continuing to evolve how we treat mental health concerns. Practitioners can work with their patients to, yes, set up the foundations for a healthy mind, but now take it a step further to encourage the setup of happiness systems. These systems that take into account an individual's specific life and circumstances and helps them set it up in a way that allows them to go to bed satisfied at night, knowing that they spent their day in a way as fulfilling as it possibly could be for them. My advice for all the 16-year-old Basleens out there who are suffering and tortured by the pain that they feel would be to get clear on what happiness means to you. Step outside of your mind. Don't even worry about it. It will follow when you create the most fulfilling life for you. Dissect your life like I did and become aware of the systems that you have created. A simple exercise you can start by doing is by asking yourself before taking any action, is what I'm doing contributing to my long-term happiness or sadness? Or if things come up during your day that contribute to a system of sadness, ask yourself how you can change your perspective so that it can seem like this specific event or circumstance is contributing to your long-term happiness. Then you can step into the role of Picasso, pick up a paintbrush, paint an incredible masterpiece of a life so that when you are what I hope you'll make it to, the ripe age of 80 or 90 or whatever age, you can be proud of the life that you have created. But for now, simply start by asking, is what I'm doing contributing? to my happiness. Thank you. Such an important and crucial message, Bisleen. Our final speaker, Dr. Kristen Donnelly, will show how businesses of all sizes can adopt a more humanistic approach to their operations without sacrificing efficiency or profit. Creating a work environment that employees desire and deserve requires a major perspective shift. But there is another way one that isn't obsessed with simply meeting the bottom line. Dr. Donnelly is a prior TEDx speaker, international empathy educator, and a researcher with two decades of experience with helping people understand the beauty and difference and the power and in inclusivity. Her talk is titled, Everyone is Replaceable and Other Lies We Live By. The crash was small. The impact was not. One of our employees was in a minor car accident during work hours. It's company policy that a member of the family goes to the hospital with anybody in that circumstance to keep them company until their family or another support system can get there. By the time that I arrived at the ER, Alex had already been checked in and put into a private room. So over the next several hours, I kept her company, told her stories, read her some news articles, talked about her family. At one point, a nurse came in and asked me to step outside the room. Alex told her no, it was fine, I could stay. The nurse looked skeptical. This is when I should say that Alex and I have different skin tones, so we are visibly, probably not biological family. The nurse asked once again if I should stay. Alex looked directly at me as she responded, no, she's family. Then the nurse asked Alex if Alex was aware that Alex was pregnant. Alex said yes. In that moment, she told the HR rep and her boss that she was pregnant about three months before it would have become apparent. The power of that moment, knowing that she trusted I would treat her pregnancy as something that deserved joy and excitement, 
and not something to be used as punitive action or even to lose her job over, which had happened to her in the past. It was one of the holiest moments of my leadership career. She knew that I would see her as Alex the human before I saw her as Alex the employee. And that difference may not seem significant, but if you've been on the wrong side of it, you know it's weight. The Small Business Administration tells us that 98.7% of all U.S. businesses are small. That means they have less than 500 employees. I'm part of the ownership team of one such business, and we are what some folks could even call a micro-business because we have less than 50 employees. There are some serious advantages to this in terms of relationships. It means that when something is happening with somebody on our team, we don't need to consult their personnel file to potentially know the details of what's going on. Meaning that anytime someone is removed from the production apparatus, everyone else has to step up to accommodate the absence. In larger companies, that might not have an issue with that second part, but it would be with the first. It balances. My point is that if we can do it with under 50, I know it can be done with over 500. It may require rewriting the employee manual or building a new room or, I don't know, whatever it would require. But what I do know is that imagination is the beginning of innovation. Asking what if is the first step, not the last. Whenever I've had these conversations, wherever I've had them, the number one response is my company is too big to do that. I keep my face as neutral and kind as possible, and I ask why. The answers fall into a couple of different categories, and there are a few that happen with regularity. We need streamlined processes as a popular one. Oh, that would just never work is another. And the most popular one is that it would hurt profits. Profits are obviously important to a business. <laughs> we have to keep the lights on and make payroll. But I have a feeling that this primacy on profits, the ultimate focus on them to the exclusion of all else is the root of the problem we find ourselves in. What if instead we understood that the employee in front of us was a human? What if we knew what brought them joy what grieved them? What if we knew what they liked about their job, what they hated about it? What if we knew them outside of what they could produce for us? What if we understood that they were a fuller person than just an interchangeable cog in the profit machine we have attempted to create? What would happen then? My father bought our company in 1991 with a partner. I was seven at the time, so my daily interactions were a little bit limited. But over the last 31 years, I've gone from a kid who scrapes bottles in front of the TV on weekends to HR rep to COO of the entire network of companies that we've built. Our mission statement is to impact lives and create holistic wealth. And that has been the driving sentiment of my entire life, not just the professional one. My family takes this to our core. It is the animating mission of who we are. And I've watched as the various members of my family enact that in their own ways. I've watched as my dad sweated and lost sleep and crunched numbers to make sure that he would never break his promise, that this place would never financially lay off anyone. I watched my mother pray for every single employee and all of their family members by name because it was the best way that she knew to support them, besides making cookies, which are very, very popular. I also watched as my brother walked alongside a lot of our employees who knew the hell of substance abuse recovery, either for themselves or for their loved ones. I've watched as we've all learned that impacting lives, treating people like humans, doesn't always stop at the last production bell. Has it been hard at times? Unspeakably. We've lived through thousands of moments that words can't reach. Has it been worth it? Indubitably. In all of the various incarnations of my role, daughter, sister, HR rep, toilet plunger, <laughs> I've talked to people all over the world in various positions in their own companies, owners, managers, 
inventors, HR reps, et cetera. And here's what I've learned about the employer side of this equation. Very few people set out to be heartless monsters who make people work through active labor, for example. Most leaders just get there because of misguided priorities, general confusion about how humans work, a complete lack of self-awareness or inclusivity, and poor education around how to manage humans. The result paves the road to proverbial hell, a culture where no one feels valued, productivity is in the basement, and the turnover rate looks like an NBA score. There is a different way. The Great Resignation is an excellent example of how we can't get back to normal. First of all, normal doesn't exist. It's just a setting on a tumble dryer. And we have been smacked in the face with so many examples of how normal wasn't working for everyone anyway. We have an opportunity, unlike any in recent memory, to imagine something different to go with something new. Why do we want to return to what wasn't working? As business leaders, we are normally obsessed with innovation. Why do we only apply it to product lines? An innovation I ask us to consider is that your employees are humans and not widgets. No one is replaceable because humans are not interchangeable. The position can be replaced, but you're still going to lose the person, the institutional knowledge, the skill sets, the entity of who they are. You're still going to lose them. And to pretend otherwise is fueling the problem that we're in, and I know that this flies in the face of decades of accepted business wisdom, and that's why I'm inviting us to innovation. If you really think about it, going back is also not an option. We learn and change every day, and we carry those new things forward with us. So if we go quote unquote back, we're still carrying things with us that weren't there before. Therefore, there is no pure way to go back. We know more now. Back isn't possible. And if you need any more examples of why going back isn't possible, I'd love to introduce you to a gentleman named Jack Shepard on the television show Lost. So, if going back isn't possible and normal isn't real, what do we do? We create. We dream. We breathe new life into old ideas, therefore making them new. We do not pour new wine into old wineskins, for that way is folly. And we don't obsess over what could have been different, for that way lies madness. One element of this new people management innovation that I am nominating connects to that word management. How we currently understand that word has got to die. Management is about managing. It's about maintaining the status quo or micromanaging. Words that we hate. Things that people complain about. Stuff that doesn't work. What we need instead is leadership. Leadership invites people into the fullness of themselves by helping them grow, change, evolve. Not only for the good of the company, but for the good of their personhood. Leadership takes into account all of their being, not just their productivity in the profit machine that we've constructed, that we call business. Management has people quitting. Leadership has people growing and innovating and changing. And isn't that what we all want anyway? We don't have a lot of details about what professional life is going to look like in the after COVID times, mostly because as you and I talk, we're not in the after times. But what we do know is that collaboration is gonna be the way of the future. So the next element we need to talk about is to collaborate well with boundaries. Does everybody in the building need to know the exact budget down to the penny and know that things are tight? No, because that much detail might actually limit their own innovation. 
Do they need to have a intricate understanding of what kept you up at 2 a.m. cleaning the fridge instead of sleeping? No, because employees are employees, therapists are therapists, and there the twain shall meet. But do they need to have some context to understand that things are rough? Yeah. A quick, hey, pals, I know I'm scattered. Things aren't great at home. Or, hey, we really can't dream as big as we want to. We're kind of on a budget right now. Let's tighten some things. All of that can go a really long way. Simple statements that imply and imbue trust help move all of this innovation in a breathtakingly fresh direction. Do we need to entertain creative ideas from an inclusive community? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> do we need to do every single suggestion? No, but we need the richness of the community to inform our final decision. Remember, soft skills are only called soft skills because they're hard to quantify. We don't advocate employing human marshmallows. Curiosity and active listening can go a really long way with every group of humans. One of the things that we've learned is that if we open disciplinary conversations with, tell us what you were thinking, or help me understand what's going on, it's a completely different thing than what the heck is wrong with you? Inviting people to understand what happened rather than what's wrong is a key element to humanity, honestly. And we need to understand why other people made the decisions they made before we can make informed choices about how we move forward. This all applies to more than just business, by the way. It is effective anywhere groups of humans gather to do life together. Schools, sports teams, community organizations, churches, synagogues, families, marriages. One final point in this discussion of what's next. Businesses of every size have to work with organizations whose cultures may not match theirs. The relationship may require a decision between doing business and guarding employees. We face this dilemma frequently, and we've come up with a system that both serves the other company's needs and guards our culture. It means that we have lost business, but we've lost very few employees. The mistakes we've made are legion, but the guiding principle remains the same. We treat people like people here, no matter what. Every moment in life is an opportunity for new. Nothing is static. Everything is breathing and moving and creating and living. And innovation is only ever a decision away. So why don't we do some of that blue sky thinking the business books are always telling us to do and apply it to how we can all human a little bit better together. I invite you to remember that the person in front of you is just that, a person. A person who comes with hopes and dreams and wisdoms and griefs and anger management struggles and deep feelings about their local hockey team and that vacation that they'll take someday, they swear, or that book they've always meant to read, or their incredibly strong, lovely feelings about their partner or their professional aspirations, and so on and so on and so on. The person in front of you is a person. And if we can remember their personhood instead of their position, we can hold potential and present in tension. Whatever new society we're building demands we prioritize humanity. And the good news is we absolutely can. We can remember people while keeping an eye on profits. We can know our team while still maintaining boundaries. And we can bring our full humanity to work because this new way of living we're constructing demands nothing less. My family and I and hundreds of thousands of people around the world have been doing this for a while and we'd love for you to join us. Welcome to the human side of business, friends. The hope is powerful. The innovation is limitless and the potential is endless.
Hello everyone. We are so happy you could join us today for our first ever TEDx Rutgers Camden brand new ending conference. Please be sure to join us tomorrow for a live speaker meet and greet over Zoom at 2 p.m. Eastern time. The RSVP link will be in the chat below. And stay connected via our social media platforms linked below, as well as our website where you can stay updated, TEDxRutgersCamden.com. And last but not least, please fill out the attendee form that will be in the chat so you can share your thoughts and comments on the conference and talks today. See you tomorrow at the live speaker meet and greet session. Thank you.